If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this awesome episode of Mind Pump, look, for the first 37 minutes, we have some fun, non-fitness related conversation. As we always do. We start out by talking about Australian gyms and how they're promoting our mindpumpfree.com site for free guides. You guys down under are pretty fucking awesome. Good die. Smart. Yes. Then we talked about California's massive economy. Was it the fifth largest economy in the world? Uh, we actually are kicking the UK's hey, we're butt. winning. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then we talked Remember about that. skinny dipped almonds. These are almonds covered in delicious chocolate. The macro breakdown on these things are really good. So if you're into your body and you want to look good, but you also like to eat delicious things, Skinny dipped is the way to go. Now, check this out. You can find skinny dipped at most stores, but there's only one place to get it for 20% off. Here's where you go skinnydipped.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump 20% off your entire order. Uh, we also talked about what is considered low income in the Bay Area. Believe it or not, it's way more than you think. Shocking. Then we talked about the average wages for Apple, Facebook, and Google. And then you'll realize why it makes sense that low income in, in the Bay Area is so high. Um, we talked about the competitive world of the internet and the future of resistance training. Then we get into the fitness portion of this episode. We start answering fitness questions. The first question was, uh, what is a great way to bulk on a budget? Bulking refers to trying to put on quality weight, uh, muscle, preferably. What's a good way to do this without breaking the bank? The next question is, uh, what are some great isolation exercises? What are our favorites? Now, isolation exercises do exactly what the name uh, says, uh, isolate muscle. So they're different than compound exercises. These are exercises designed to really target specific areas. We give some of our favorites and why. I had a hard time. The next question, uh, can we talk about how we first got certified as personal trainers that's what we did. We talked all about our early days as personal trainers, what it was like to get certified, and we talked about the business of gyms. And the final question, this person is saying, look, Instagram uh, and other social media accounts are flooded with these really fit, hot-looking idiots who are giving terrible fitness advice. Uh, when is that going to stop? What can we do about it? We give our advice. We talk about what we think Needs to happen. If you can't beat them, join them. To prevent the spread of crappy fitness and health information. And lastly, I'd like to remind everybody that MAPS Anabolic, our foundational flagship fitness program, the one that is the best for speeding up your metabolism, building muscle, and building strength, is 50% off all month long. It's half off. All you got to do is go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Use the code RED50, R-E-D-5-0, no space, for 50% off. A new version will be released soon. So if you already have MAPS Anabolic or if you get it now with the 50% off, you'll get updated automatically. We also have other fitness programs. So we have lots of fitness programs for different goals. Uh, and believe me, one of them will work good for you. So I don't care what your goals are. Go on mapsfitnessproducts.com, uh, check them out, find the one that works best for you, and get started. It's a great way to get in shape. We got your back. How cool is this? Over in Australia, somebody, I believe it's Australia, uh, I think that's what I saw the conversation back and forth Taylor had, so a, a gym owner or a trainer or somebody printed off a sheet of paper that has all of our free guides and the link to mindpumpfree.com underneath it for their members. I Put thought it that on was, their gym? Yeah, that was so cool. You that know, is really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something. I mean, straight up, I really like Australia. I've never been there, right? Yeah. but I get a lot of messages from You guys got to give us a reason to come out. I get a lot of messages from people who listen to us in Australia. Yeah. They love our, our sense of humor, um, and um, there, there's a, a really strong fitness community there. I, I, in fact, who is it? Was it who is it that told us, like, you got to go to Australia. They have the be I did my best fitness seminars there. Jordan, Jordan Shallow. Jordan yeah. said that. Of course, Lane loves it there, Lane but of course he met, you know, well, yeah, we, he met Holly. We know there. why he loves it. There. Yeah, that's why he yeah. likes it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I heard, um, uh, I've heard nothing but good things there. Yeah. Here's what keeps me from going there. Just, I'm going to be straight Spiders. up. Spiders. Spiders. 
I bet. Oh my god! And and they're just big. and and sharks. They're big. I'm not jellyfish. Like, sharks and jellyfish are not going to get me <laughs> in the hotel room. <laughs> well, spiders might. You, the, that is very true. They're big spiders. I've heard Did, that they'll get you when you're taking a shit too, which is even more scary. Spiders. Yeah. Why are they attracted like, like, to? Well, the, they're like in the pipes, and then they kind of crawl out no they don't this, this did you uh, urban did you, urban legend did you oh. watch chris delia's new stand-up where he talks shit about australia oh yes he's mad i did because he's no, like uh-huh. he's been like four days there and i haven't seen one kangaroo yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like expecting kangaroos to yeah. be hopping yeah. around yeah. everywhere i like, did see koalas that. i feel like people think that about like think uh like the surf culture in california they think like if you fly to california 100 well, percent. i will surf- attest to that right <laughs> like everybody was baffled that i was as white as i am yeah, <laughs> they just couldn't like wrap their brain around it. That's just because you're super white. It's baffling. Uh, yeah, but it's Northern California. <laughs> like nobody here is like, oh, I'm tanning every day, bro. Like shock and arnar. You know, not, it's just it's not happening. Why, why is it baffling? It's not like you were you know born and raised in Ghana. You know what I'm saying? Like it makes sick if there's white people in California. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying though. A lot of people think that California. They it's just all think, beaches. Yeah, they think all beaches. So they think yeah. that like you must surf. Like, I, have, I, I don't know how many people I've told like that are yeah. that have never been to California. They, they think we surf. They think we're all just like crazy hippie, hippie liberals. You yeah, know? Like, had, I'm like, I'm, I'm none of those things. Yeah, well, there's I, more than a 50 50 chance they could hit it right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's well, a lot. Yeah, there, no, no doubt. Yeah, but. 90%. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, my cousins from Italy when, when I was younger, and they, they would ask me, like, where are you from? Oh, when, you know, when I'd go there and visit, and their friends would ask me, where are you from? They'd be like, California. They'd be like, oh, have you seen Michael Jackson? Like, Cal- <laughs> you know, I'm like, California. Oh, yeah, big, dude. Yeah. It's bigger All the time than, at Whole Foods. Yeah, I'm like, it's, it's bigger than <laughs> yeah. this whole country. It's literally bigger than Italy. California is yeah. larger than Italy is. Fifth largest economy in the world. You guys know that? Crazy. It's the just fifth, here, it, just California, compared to even countries. What well, do the fifth largest economy in the world? Period. All the wow. tech, com- everything you see on the internet is like the physical buildings of it are mm. right here. Even a, a lot of it, yeah. and then you have Hollywood, which is a huge. It's shrinking, but it's still a huge uh, industry. Yeah, um, uh, farming industry in California, right. massive. So it's, uh, it's you huge. never th- yeah we you also, never think about that we also supply Central Valley we also supply over eight I think it's eighty eight percent of all marijuana for the entire country oh we do yeah now we do oh go team wow yeah. California's economy is larger than the UK's that's fucked oh, up dude. we we just kicked your ass uh, another way that's oh, uh, <laughs> oh no. uh, you trying to lose listeners yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> USA USA <laughs> that's the other place I would love to uh, I'd I'd love to go is the UK no, no we got, I, I, yeah. we got I a lot of support there. out there too yeah. or we did uh, yeah we no. did sorry <laughs> not thanks to Justin <laughs> right ever since we talk, found- they're all my people dude what, yeah. what? Doug look up I'm, would just, you look, I'm being competitive look up the marijuana stat that I just rattled off I believe it's eighty something percent yeah, what where is most of the marijuana produced in the world how much yeah how much marijuana does uh, does California produce for the country? Yeah, you got to learn how to use Google better. That's not going to tell you what you want to know at, a, at all. <laughs> if, while he's doing that, my yeah. my cousin sent me a picture because he listens to our show. His college campus. Guess what they have in the fucking snack shop in there? What skinny dipped? Oh yeah, in, no, in college in their college uh, snack whatever shop or whatever. Wow, skinny dipped almonds. That's are your in there. cousin? Yeah, no, 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 not the one we had on the main page. Oh, yeah, he texted me. Oh, okay. And uh, I was like, damn, I was like, there's there's actually quite a few colleges in that have it because I've I've gotten the same DM and I didn't think it was your cousin. Bro, it's um skinny dips everywhere. Yeah, and here's what exploded. I told him. Here's what I told him because I'm like, uh, did you get that through our code? And he goes, no, I just bought it. I'm like, bro. I'm going to smack you. What's our discount? No, no, forget. What's 20, our discount? 20%. Yeah, 20. if you're, if you're going to buy that shit, buy it in bulk, get it uh, through our code, use our code for 20% off. You're not going to get 20% off at your college Bro. campus. Right. I'm telling you more. the combo Support right now. Support your favorite podcast. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? The combo is what I'm having right now, which is the, the, the mocha or the cappuccino almonds with our nitro brew. Oh yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah. Bomb. That's I already like. Mix. I already like the coffee it's ones. Great flavor. But, but you have it with like cold brew and the and then the, if you put the almonds in the refrigerator so they're cold. Yeah. Oh, oh man, that's where it's at. It's a lot of foreplay there before you eat it. <laughs> uh, that's the last time I've heard that before. Hey, uh, Doug, what does it say over there? Are you trying to figure it out still? He's yeah. just as bad of a Googler as I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How much? Oh, here we, we go. On these Google There's skills. a little infographic there. So we'll figure out how much weed is grown in California. We are the we. I think we are one of the weed capitals of the world for sure. Do you no, know we why? We are. We are. Because you know? yes, I do. It's our climate. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's our climate's perfect. It's perfect for indicas more than anything, right? 
Uh, because it cools down at night. Well, parts of it, right? So, like, it's as you north, as you get right? yeah, as you get northern yeah. California and especially towards Tahoe and stuff like that, purples and your and your indicas mm-hmm. tend to do better. But southern California, it's the opposite. You get we can do more sativa. Yeah, you could do sativa desert, like you know, San Fernando OG is where OG kind of originated from. So, wow. yeah, wow, that's cool. Yeah, well, good good for you, California. Are they counting that in our in our economy? They are now. Yeah. They right? have to, yeah, they have to be. They have to be. Of course. What did, what did that thing say? Two point seven trillion dollars. Uh, this economy is producing mm-hmm. trillion dollars in California. That's a lot. Isn't that crazy? That no. is crazy. So if you took twenty Californias, you still wouldn't pay off the de- the the, de- the national deficit. Oh, speed of marijuana. Terrible. Did you see the article no. that Jackie? Had, that I think it was Jackie who sent this. So Jackie's been on fire. Jackie, she's killing everybody with the good article. Yeah, tell everybody what we do right and now. You so should tell the audience. Jackie knows how we think. Yeah, we have a we have a group thread with our with our mind pump team. You know, with our staff, and we encourage everybody to share articles with us that they find that are very interesting. And uh, Enzo will send some. Jackie sends a ton. Yeah. Taylor sent one in yeah, his entire one. life. No, yeah, he's in a couple. Maybe yeah, two. two. No, he sent some good ones R- lately. Rachel sent one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Eli sent one. Um, but and that's it. I don't think anybody else sent any more. So keep yeah. it up, guys. Yeah, Jackie's killing Jackie's it. Jackie's yeah. destroying everybody. Yeah. But what did she send? What was it? No, she sent uh, it, the, the company DSW, the shoe company. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Oh, is it what? that automatic electric shoe or whatever? No, 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 no. Oh, my bad. DS- <laughs> DSW, you, you know guessing. what DSW is, don't you? Mm. Yeah, that's like the discounted shoe. Yeah, like, shoe warehouse, like a Nordstrom Rack kind of yes, shoes. Yes, yes. Yeah. There's one off of Stevens Creek. I know what DSLs are. Is, no. You get great shoes there. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a pop. It's a very popular company, the shoe company. Uh, them and, and another company, I forgot who the, the name of the other company was. Just invested like a uh, hundred million, a hundred million into marijuana. Just uh, yeah, just the saw, shoe company. Yeah, yeah, that's why it was interesting to me. I thought that was really fascinating that a shoe company, but it just shows that everybody you make everything out of hemp. Hemp now, or dude. What? Hemp is a great uh, textile. Yeah, it's super durable. Grows really fast. You know what's interesting? I, w- I wonder if there'll be a big surge of that. Yes, like clothing. Yes, absolutely. Right, B- uh, bags, clothing, um, materials, and building. Yeah, hemp. Uh, you, you guys know what hempcrete is? It's this. Concrete like material built out of hemp that is light and strong. Right. Here's why hemp is so awesome. It grows quickly. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard to grow. It's, it's extremely really strong fibrous. Extremely right? fibrous yeah. and it's not expensive, especially now that they've lifted the regulations. Yeah. It's gonna be incredible. It's L- gonna be amazing. It's listen, right here it is right yeah, here. We're so in d- cotton. It's a uh, designer shoe warehouse, okay? That's DSW, better known by its initials, DSW. Uh, signed a $100 million contract with Green green Growth Brands to sell its 7th Synth brand, which offers CBD-infused products including muscle bombs, body lotion, body washes, and foot creams. Today, Tilray, so Tilray Incorporated, T-I-L-R-A-Y Incorporated, has signed a long-term revenue-sharing agreement to market and distribute cannabis products. Just interesting, right? I just think it's fascinating that- There's going to be a bubble. It's, uh, it, it, it's the, like everybody is jumping on Yeah, that. it's going to be a bubble for a second, and then it's going to pop and then come down normal, you know? Because mm. we're going to see marijuana-infused fucking toilet paper and everything. <laughs> I don't. Do you think it'll be a bubble? Or, yeah, you, or do you, or you say you guys both say definitely very fast there. Well, here's, here, here's, why, here's why I disagree. Because I think it's more closely related to alcohol. And I don't think alcohol is a bubble. I think that it's been something that is has been with us and has become a staple. Yeah, but in our, that's it, not what I mean. I know what you're saying. Uh, uh, yeah. In terms of total size, it's not going to go away. I, but. In terms of total revenue, no, I don't think that kind of bubble. Right. right? What I mean by bubble is like the dot com. Uh, when, remember when all of a sudden no, see, everybody think, was doing dot com? I think it's a bad example. I think I think we're comparing it to alcohol, which pro- this is what probably happened after prohibition. We probably had. Everybody was like, "Oh, it's going legal." Yeah. Everybody's now because is it a distributor for alcohol, and everyone's putting their money into it. And then uh, what ends Bars up happening? Just sprung up everywhere. A couple big monsters come in and really dominate the market, but it's still the market a, overall here, still grows. Here's a comparison that I'm trying to give. So imagine if alcohol uh, all of a sudden became legal, and now we have now we know what the main reasons that people buy alcohol for now are drinks, right? But imagine if alcohol first became legal and it was like. Alcohol bombs, alcohol shampoo, alcohol toilet paper. That alcohol- is how it started. Right. And that's gone. That's all gone. Right. So I don't think the marijuana market is a bubble in the sense that it's going to grow and then shrink in terms of total revenue. I think it's a bubble in terms of all the products we're going to see, all the promises. That's all. Uh, they're, they're selling it like it's fucking fairy dust. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. put this on everything. It makes everything better. Okay, relax. It's yeah. not. That's not true. It's not. Everything's better uh, with with cannabis. And I don't. I think there's ways of uh, applying it and using it efficaciously. And there's ways that, like like the balms, rubbing it into your skin. Okay. I have yet to see studies to show that that really does anything. I know you can eat it and, and take it that way, but yeah. how is it going to oh, work? Oh, I can see beauty products, all that kind of <laughs> stuff, like facial masks, you know, CBD infused, like all that shit. Like they're going to go nuts with it for a long time. Yep, yep. That's the bubble part. So, yeah. so check out this other article that Jackie sent. This one was fascinating to me. So do you guys want to know what the typical employee at Apple makes versus the typical employee at Facebook and the typical uh, employee at Google. Oh, I'm so excited to hear this Ooh. because I got into a thing with my two best friends last so night. We're it talking has to shit. Be pretty comparable, so, no? Well, so keep in mind because uh, Apple, the typical Apple, I'm guessing Apple employee, Go- make, Google pays the most. Okay, so the the average Apple employee, fifty five thousand dollars a year. Wow, that's it. But but they get stock options. No, I think they're well, counting well, they're all counting the, retail employees. Yes, I think they're you know, count, they like also at count the stores. Exactly. Uh, okay. Cuz I think if you remove those then you'll yeah. probably see. So here's the thing that really fucking tripped me out. You know what the average employee, medium. This is why shit's so expensive in California, especially what? in the Bay Area. The average employee at Facebook makes 240 grand a year. Whoa. Middle. <laughs> Everybody's quiet. Whoa. That's fucked up. That's the medium a is quarter, average? A, almost a quarter million dollars a year. That's what the average fucking employee makes at, at, at uh, Facebook. Facebook. Wow. They're Damn. paying. No wonder shit's so expensive. It, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Wow. It yeah. pays to steal but your information. It, but <laughs> but yes, to your to your point, that I think the stores are what's bringing the Apple, Apple way down. Of course. Because and if that's you were, international too. So you got to yeah. account for So what is what does Facebook have? There's no there's no Facebook stores. No. So no. everybody who works it's at Facebook are here. engineers yeah. and designers and people that are yeah. already six figure type employees. Right. So I get why that I mean well, so and Google, the average employee, Google's got to be the highest. I they have think. to have the best benefits, I'm uh, going to guess. $197,000. Oh, so wow. less. Uh. But again, like that's an insane average salary. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. What's the uh, Well, I mean, in my like, niece work, has worked for well, both why. Google and Facebook. Wow. And so the comparison that she gives so, me So like if you don't make shit at fucking Google, you're making a lot of money. She makes really good money. Yeah, that's probably young. why. That's probably why Apple's worth, like you know, liquid cash is is they're, has the highest they're amount because they're <laughs> skimping all that shit. No, no it's the retail. It's got to be. Yeah, the I know. That, I that, know. Yeah. But that like they they have the most cash is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, but I mean, no wonder houses and shit are so expensive around here when the average employee is making a quarter million dollars a year. But you know what? You know what? It just came out the other day. Do you know what's considered now? Um, how much money you need to make to be considered poor in California? $117,000 <laughs> a year. If you make one hundred seventeen grand a year- That was like, as a kid, that was like my, my fucking goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If I could get there, I'd be rich. Like, Whoa. One hundred seventeen grand a year, pretty much anywhere else uh, in, in America. Yeah, you're, you're, you're doing awesome. You're doing really well. In the world, you're rich. Like you're 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 wealthy, right. but here it's considered. Look up what the what they if they use the word poverty. I don't think it's poverty that they use like below middle class. I don't remember what it was. But no, it was it was you were considered you you could uh, you could apply for like low income if you were. <laughs> yeah, so it was. No, it was. Yeah, it was. It was. I saw the article. I remember when it came out. I was like, oh, I told Katrina right away. I was like, do you know what we should use? I said, yeah. we should use one of your jobs where you're only making this much, and then we should apply for that. She's oh like, no. my god. Could you- <laughs> You, what, what does that say right there? Oh, that's Kaiser. Can you imagine? Can you imagine like you have a, let's say you're some kid. From, there it is, right there. Eighty four thousand no, a year no, now no, qualifies as low income. No, that's old. That's Orange County too. Yeah. No, that's that's old. It was one hundred seventeen. Imagine if you're there. It is. Families yeah. earning one hundred seventeen thousand now qualifies low yes. income. Yes. Yes. Yeah, wow. That's ridiculous. So imagine this: you're you got like family visiting from out of the state, you know, because you moved here or whatever. And your mom's, you know, you open up your wallet, you're at the grocery store, you open up your wallet, you pull out food stamps. And your mom's like, oh my God, like, you came to Cali, like, are you okay? Is everything okay? You're like, well, I mean, I only make 117 grand. 114 <laughs> grand yeah, yeah, yeah. a year. Like, I'm, I'm getting by. Need, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, I'm that's, taking the bus. That's absolutely yeah. insane to me. Anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it was that's cracking. Crazy. It's got to come back down, dude. It has to. Nope. Uh, I, I think it's we're getting, playing with monopoly money at this point, aren't we? I mean, think about this for a second, okay? 
Because then you then you pair that with stats to Justin's point of like, what's the uh, average person in California's debt? Like, how much debt are they are they working with? Uh, yeah. Probably a lot, especially yeah. houses, right? Yeah. But just think about this way: if you walk into Facebook net today, which they have a lot of employees, there's thousands of employees in California, and Facebook's a huge company. So you walk in there, every other person you run into is making more than a quarter million dollars a year. That's how much, that's that's what it means. Two hundred forty is the middle. Yeah. yeah. So every other person you see a high deal, a high five, like that guy makes three hundred grand, that guy makes three hundred fifty grand. That may my 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 cousin or my niece's uh, position for Facebook is to recruit those people. So she that's there. She has a position where she gets paid really good money to do nothing but try and poach people like from Google and from all these other companies to come work for Facebook and offer them more money. It's actually really interesting to listen to like how that how that that process works for her, like how they figure out they have like tiers like based off your education, mm-hmm. your experience, mm-hmm. or like that, like from other companies. Like okay, this person we can give them this much, and then they go back and forth and they negotiate. Well, that. so this is a great example of um, how the the how markets can really work very well for uh, for people for what's it not not just consumers but for people um, who are employed. You know, tech is a very minimally regulated industry, mainly because it emerged and grew and progressed faster than it could be regulated, right? It's just out of nowhere. I mean, the internet itself is really a self-organized piece of anarchy, if you think about it. Like, if you look at the internet and you go online and you navigate and do things, nobody, there was no government agency, there was no regulation that came forward and said, okay, here's how everything's going to work. Yeah. It was literally, lines were created, that's about as far as it went, and then it just it just literally self-organized because this is what people do and this is what markets do. And tech did that, and so what's happened is because of the minimal regulations of this industry and because it's one of the, it's, it's uh, running the world right now, it's growing so fast that companies like, the reason why they pay so much is because it's highly competitive. I mean, if you have skills... Yeah that are, 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 if you have tech skills, you have a lot of people wanting your skills because there's only so many people who, and these companies are growing so fast that the demand is so high and the supply is low that you, here you are, you're a programmer or let's just say you're a video editor or someone. Oh, look what we're going through right now. Exactly. I mean, we just had a meeting this morning uh, all about this. I mean, that's one of our greatest challenges right now with scaling is we don't. We need more hands on deck. We need more editors, more people talented on that side of the business uh, to help speed up the process. Well, you know, it's interesting. Did you watch uh, any of the trials when they had like Mark Zuckerberg and they're trying to like go through like <laughs> yes, like all these old barnacles like asking them questions they about no the idea. internet? Yeah. Like it was painful. Yeah. It, it highlighted such like a disconnect. Yeah, a disconnect. Like so, you if you're getting everybody in, in government positions that are mm-hmm. you know mandating certain or, or creating laws or restrictions or whatever, they have no fucking idea uh you know what they're dealing with dude if you look up online the average what did the average web page look like six years ago yeah okay and you'll see how archaic it looks in six years how quickly it's changed and like i said if 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 you're somebody that appreciates what technology has done um and how fast it's grown or maybe you're not aware maybe you're just not aware but if you really stop and look you'll see that it has literally it's transformed society in a faster. It's created more wealth and more opportunities than anything else in such a short period of time. One of the reasons for that is it's free flowing. There's almost nothing that stops you. I remember when when Doug and I first created uh, Maps Anabolic, and I sat down with him like, okay, we need to get a, a like a business license. And he looks at me, and he goes, business license what, for where? It's on the internet. There's, we don't get one. And I remember being like, whoa, there's so much because when I opened up my personal training studio. There were so many more hurdles and things I had to jump through yeah. to get that business going versus online when there's it's just go. And it's all like I said, it's it's literal anarchy and it's self-organized and you're starting to and you're seeing it get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner in a very very short period of time. Do you think it's going to mm-hmm. get regulated the same way? I mean, to that point, I was just talking to uh, Scott and CC over at Red Dot. Love those guys over there. <clears throat> great Bay Area. fitness yeah yeah great Bay Area gym too so if you're somebody who's looking for a personal tra- trainer in the Bay Area the quality high tra- quality trainers yeah the yeah. trainers that they hire over there um, you guys may see some of the videos that we shoot we shoot some videos over there they're right up the road from us and uh, really like them but he was telling me like man the 
how long it took them to get that place up and running because of all the red tape they had to go through, through the city. Oh yeah, yeah. so yeah, it was crazy. just an absolute fucking nightmare. It's 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 insane, and all it does is it slow. It, all it does is dramatically slow down innovation. And again, you look at the internet. I remember when eBay first, uh, and eBay is now one of the, considered one of the dinosaurs online. How funny is that, right? Yeah. But I remember when eBay first came out. Here was this company that was going to allow people to buy things from other people that they've never met or, or and they yeah. got so much criticism mm-hmm. retail stores were laugh like big retail companies were laughing like oh people are gonna get ripped off it'll never work it's terrible uh you know p- people aren't gonna see each other so it's gonna be this horrible and you know what's funny their success rate is better you're, you're more likely to have better quality mm-hmm. going through ebay than you would through retail stores and of course, we know what happened. eBay they exploded and very, very well. And and a lot of the criticisms were because of lack of regulation. Oh, there's no regulation controlling it. This, that, and the other. No, it regulated Bullshit. itself. That's yeah. it. And, and there was, sh- you know, people that would not provide what they were promising, and they got, you know, blackballed then. Yep. And 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 that's just how it's a filtration process of like who's a good seller, who's a good buyer. We figure this out, like, and everybody sort of, you know, knows what to expect. And, and what to get. Out here's of it. here's a, a another fantastic example. I love this example because it's so taboo. When you look at the black market for drugs, which uh, by the way is a massive, massive billions and billions Are you of talking dollars. About Silk Road drug, yeah, drugs, yeah. just black market, like all the all the stuff that's strictly regulated. You know, you know, everything from cocaine to psychedelics to whatever. And when you look at the how the internet kind of evolved and allowed people to buy and sell drugs online, the quality of the, because I've seen reports on this, it's really fascinating, the quality and cleanliness of the drugs has gone through the roof because people are buying them online and what's end up happening is if, if someone sells, and I'm not advocating for, for drug use at all, but, but a real, this is real now, a huge percentage of accidents no, and it's overdoses. Tur- it's turned into like the Wikipedia for, for drugs. Well, it, it, it's, it's like you have a collection of so many people using that website and they're giving reviews. Like it polices itself. It's amazing. That's what I'm I saying. I watched this happen with steroids, being somebody that's used them in my early 20s all the way into my mid to late 30s. When you first were to buy steroids, it was like you had to know somebody who went down to Mexico and got them or trust that this person- you didn't even know if it was real Yeah, you didn't know anything. And it was like a rolling the dice if you got something. Where now, man, there's places online where it's like, dude, this guy has a five-star rating. I I mean, I've had situations of ordering. This is totally putting myself out there. Where you, you order and it's coming from like overseas- and the guy cares so much about his rating online that if something got r- snagged in the mail, we're like, hey, I didn't receive my product. He's like, don't worry about it. Refund your money or ships a, a new, a whole new thing over because he's so concerned that he's going to get a bad review. It's so funny because yeah. uh, it, this is real now. A, a, a large percentage of the accidents and overdoses and deaths that happen from drug use is because people don't know what the quality is. So here's a simple example. If you're somebody who uses uh, you know, heroin, and you get it from one dealer, and then you, another dealer gives you heroin, and the strength is way different. Boom, you get an overdose. Or if it's some other drug that feels like heroin, but it's a designer drug, or it's some other bath salt, or some crazy shit, right? Well, because of these, because online people are rating each other, the market is this is free market at work. People stuff is cleaner, less overdoses, and and again, I'm not advocating for yeah, anything. It's just but safer it's, though. It's just an example of, yeah. of how this works. Uber is another great example. So. You know, and when you look at and look how that's have you. I mean, look at what happens when you go to an Uber car now. I mean, I remember so when much it, for, be- better. Oh, you get you get in the car smells good. The guy's got an iPhone charger, yeah, water Google, for if you want. He's it, got an Android it. charger ready for you. There's a little snack right there, a mints. It's like <laughs> it's crazy. It's cr- it's it's insane. And so, but and, they want their good reviews. And, and again, you know, the, the, the and reason why I'm saying this is when people look at how much money people are making in tech. Um, it's again, it's because it's a, it's such a growing industry. It's so competitive yeah. that Google's comparing, competing with Apple and they're competing with oh, Facebook. Rapid innovation. Oh, you know how, you know how many times Facebook poaches people from other tech companies and vice versa? It's hilarious. Oh, it's a game. It's a game back oh, and forth. Oh, I just told you there's, I yeah. mean, she has a position. They have a, it's her a, job. They yeah. have, she literally <laughs> moved out to, to New York. They created an office and because of course here was the, is the hub, right? So this is the main place is here in California. Well, that's grown and it's become so big. This is spreading so fast that New York now has a hub. Now this hub is, that's all they do. 
is go recruit people. Mm-hmm. Like go hire and staff people for Facebook. There's a whole department, a whole building dedicated to that, and they've now built it out in New York, and that's why she she's moved out there for that. And that's all they're doing is trying to poach these talented people from mm-hmm. all these other companies. I mean, that's how competitive it's become. It's, it's crazy. Anyway, so uh, I have another uh, interesting study that somebody just sent, sent me that is there's this i've been talking about this now for a while where the medical community is now starting to catch up to the incredible longevity and health benefits of weights of resistance training lifting weights nice Uh, because for a long time you go to the doctor and the recommendation was 30 minutes of vigorous cardiovascular activity and it was never to lift weights and in fact if you had certain conditions like let's say you go to the to the doctor because you have uh, you know, angina, you know, of the heart, or you have some kind of, uh, you know, myocardial infraction or, you know, post heart attack, whatever. Many times what they'll say is don't ever lift anything over five pounds. Um, you know, don't lift anything over 10 pounds or whatever. We don't want you to exert your heart, but just make sure you do cardiovascular activity. And what they're saying in this paper that was just recently published, this is from Bay- Baylor University, is that this is wrong, that they're probably reducing people's quality of life and health because. These people are afraid to lift weights after they've had these cardiovascular type incidents. And there's some studies now that are showing that people who do lift weights later on when they're cleared to do so have a, a, an incredible increase in quality of life and longevity mm-hmm. and that now they're going to start looking at recommending resistance training specifically to people who've had a lot of these issues. Which this is again, it's that trend. It, you know, we're starting to catch up now. We're wait. I seriously think, I swear to God, I think we're five to ten years away from weight training being the way uh, people the work standard. out. That's the standard. It's yeah. not going to be running. It's not going to be cardio. It's not going to be going on a bike or swimming. Well, it's going to be yeah, lift weights. It, it's just about the right dose, and and that's you know that's the the part that has to be discerned. It's like you know you. First of all, there's a lot of skill involved in it, and so there, there's got to be that. So the education process of that, like being implemented in the schools, is going to be vital to really like spreading that, you know, further. We talked about that, but I think, um, you know, in terms of like people understanding that not to overdo it, that's why we stress that point so much because uh, you want it to benefit you. You want to benefit your body. There's health practices involved with lifting weights, not mm-hmm. just purely performance and aesthetic driven. I go back and forth on if I agree with that or not. Why? Because of the complexity of weight yep, training? Yeah, yep. it is. That's yeah. the one thing. That- yeah, because I, I, I want to I agree with you and, and believe that because it seems like all the signs are pointing that way. The science is pointing that way. Uh, it makes obvious sense to us, but then sometimes I wonder if that's just me inside of my bubble thinking this way and it's mm. like... For the average person, the the idea of learning how to squat properly or do well, a movement like that is just so complex that it's, you know, and the and requires unfor- more instruction. Yeah, and unfortunately, we live in this society of instant gratification, and we don't want to work for anything. We don't want to do a little extra effort, even if it means it's that well, much better. Think for about us. it this way, because because I I I've went down this path. I was thinking exactly like that the other night when I got this study, and I'm really working through my mind, like how, what are the different uh, directions that society could go with this. Either it could shut them down, like, oh, it's too complex, I don't want to do it. Or I started thinking of the old recommendations of, of cardiovascular activity, go out for a run. Running is actually incredibly complex, massively complex. It's a skill like anything else. And if you don't, if you weren't born running like humans were 10,000 years ago, then going out and running it, without practicing learning the biomechanics, getting your body used to it, it's just as sh- stupid as going in the gym and squatting without all that preparation. So, there could be a benefit to the perceived complexity of resistance training versus the perceived uncomplex, the, the, how uncomplex running is, even though it is. And what I think might also happen is people may finally, finally look at exercise and realize there's skill involved. Well, you know what I'm saying? Well, my hope is that with technology innovation and educators out there and like easier, accessible information that we'll be able to keep refining that process before mainstream really, you know, adopts it. So it's, you know, that that part of it being that, yes, it is complex. There's a lot of different um, directions and, and skills and movements that you have to learn. Um, but what's step one? You know, like if, if somebody were to put that in, like this became uh, a, a real straightforward process, and that that puts a lot of weight back on people 
you know, like any educator like us or, or any other people putting out programs like like present it in a way that is, you know, refined. Well, that's we're, a good, that's we're a good point. I mean, the success of this business is banking on that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I if we want to talk about mind pump being around 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Yeah, this your your theory is it's important, and I hope that we're a part of that movement. I mean, I think, I think I think we're all counting on that that we will be part of that wave that happens and simplifying weight training for the average person and making it as a very easy uh, entry level, right? To so where it's not this hard transition of oh, I don't know anything about weight training, mm-hmm. I kn- but I've heard that it's supposed to be the best for me, but I'm scared to death to do it, like. Well, we Hopefully were just, we've we've we're starting to make that. Yeah, and we were just talking about markets and the, and how when they get competitive, it gets better. If it does, in fact, in five to ten years, become the way that people really like. All of a sudden, there's all this interest. I want to work out. I need to lift weights. I heard lifting weights is the best way to be healthy. And now you have everyday, you know, everyday Joes and everyday Janes instead of going out and getting on a treadmill and a bike, wanting to lift weights. The market's going to explode. For that kind of information, which means it's going to be more competitive, which means theoretically uh, the ones that'll do well are the ones that are delivering the best information. And it may just wash out a lot of the crappy stuff and may cause like, hey, you know, who knows the the future workout videos for the everyday, you know, uh, mom and pop people or whatever. the, the, The future workout videos may just be, you know. Today's work. Today's workout. We're gonna, you know, do some priming, and then we're gonna learn how to squat, and then we're gonna learn how to do a push up, and then your workout's over. Like that may be what they end up looking like. Who yeah. knows? Especially if the market explodes the way that I think it totally can. And then also, if if you're a person, and this this has been predicted now for a while, even way back when I got my my first personal training certification, the 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 personal trainers um, in some way, shape, or form. I think is going to grow. I think that market's going to grow. I think a large percentage of reason why it's going to grow is going to be beginners and uh, and people who are you know looking to get healthier. I don't. I think the market for like maximum you know performance and all that yeah. stuff. I think it's always. I see small. a big. I see a big opportunity in the way that we even now just through experience have realized what you present somebody that's just getting started is everything, and like that process of. How can I how can I be so specific that I only give them like this little bit before we then move forward? So mm-hmm. what does that look like? Mm-hmm. You know, is, are we just learning the squat? Are we just learning about nutrition? Are we just learn like what are those very basic foundational things to build off of look like? And then, you know, we keep going further down the rabbit hole. And I think it's a lot it like the the simplification of it is everything. And I think that there's a way to do it where you can get somebody who doesn't know anything to really feel comfortable that like, Oh wow, I can do this. Yeah. Cause it, it's, you know, if you look at the, the fitness industry as a whole, it's a relatively young industry. I mean, it really started to take off. I would say in the late eighties, mid eighties when, you know, yeah, the, at home workout videos, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Jane Fonda, that's when it kind of started taking off for exercise. And gyms, you know, at that time were still not that big. You know, men only lifted weights and women did aerobics back then. And so it's really not a – it hasn't been that long. It's been long enough for people now to maybe realize the some of the bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I don't think the old methods or the old ways of communicating information – work as well today because now it's been around long enough that people are starting to hear some of the right stuff you know what i mean some of the good information like uh, if i were to say you know if i were to make a a video a fitness video today that said hey ladies don't lift heavy weights because you'll get bulky i'm gonna get a lot more people who are gonna be like that's wrong Right. Then, you know, 15 years ago. Right, right. You know, so yeah. who knows? Information has traveled forever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just the, the, the only, um, I hate to say it, it's not pessimistic, but the more realistic attitude I have about it is that 
we tend to be evolving to this less and less and easier and easier type of a society. Like we're always looking for the, mm -hmm. and, and the, it's an opposite message that we're sending, which is, you know, you want to put the work in, you want to mm -hmm. take your time, you want to learn People how to People are riding this. scooters now instead of walking. Right, yeah, right. Ex kind of screwed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So sometimes uh, I, I know that we're fighting an uphill battle when it comes to the message that we're yeah. presenting and, you know, I don't know. Maybe it will be something that just those that care about personal it's, it's growth weird, and, right? and, and yeah. learning that they, they will and then the others. That's what I was going to say because it's weird because humans are kind of funny. We we tend to like swing way over here and then swing over there. Yeah. And maybe we've had enough generations now of obesity and poor movement patterns and just shit health from the crap that we're eating that it's, it's starting to swing. Back. Maybe, yeah, maybe in the other direction. It's funny because I, I was reading an article on um, – on the I generation, right? That's the younger, younger generation and how much different they are than the millennials. You talked about this in that book, I gen. Yeah. And, um, you know, like the millennials are the ones that, this is a stereotype, by the way, obviously you look at individuals, it all breaks down, but generally speaking, the millennials are the ones that get offended about everything. They're the ones that, you know, the trigger words and all that stuff. Um, the, the I younger generation, the I generation is the opposite. They're super into like offensive shit. They say horrible things. Yeah, they, yeah. They're they're way way different, and I wonder if it's just in rebellion to mm -hmm. their the totally, older generation. Totally is that yeah. I think, and again it'll happen again ten years later or whatever. Yeah. Speaking of the books that we talk about on here, I I, so I get this a lot in the DMs. It, Jackie puts that in the show notes, so if you're if you hear us talk about a book and you're interested in reading it, it's there's direct links in the show notes. So like when we bring up iGym, if you go in today's show notes. You'll be able to link right to that book just so people know because I get a lot of DMs of people asking me, what was that book or this or that? It's like, mm. yeah, same here. Yeah, look at the show notes. It's yeah. in there for you. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. First up is John Dick. Yeah, all right. What's up, Dick? Hey, Dick. Big guy. He's a big guy. <laughs> how, how do you bulk on a budget? Uh, top ramen and chicken thighs. <laughs> that, oh, wow. that's, that's not a bad That's suggestion. a college staple right yeah. there. Oh, yeah. that's terrible. Oh, man. I grew on that. Ta uh, on top ramen? Top ramen and chicken thighs. Did you really? Probably. Isn't top... Doug, can you pull up top ramen <sighs> ingredients? Hey, we're... Okay. That's just I've heard of... Shit. I wait heard somebody a, did like... Way into tuna and Diet Coke. Wait a second here. Okay. All right. It's bulking on a budget. This is not the healthy... This is the question is not, Adam, what is the healthiest way for me to bulk? It is, Adam, what, how the cheapest way uh, I can bulk? He's like, you can buy Coca-Cola for less than water. Stop drinking water. Start <laughs> That's drinking right. Coke. That's right. Get that sugar I'm in I'm just there. saying. I Do mean, the math. Well, you, you can... I mean, no joke, you can... For really, really good uh, price. Wow, look at the let's look at the ingredients here. Forget the calories. I want to see what's the, what like it's made of. Um, you can. There's things that are worse out there. You hey, can you buy can dog there's, food. There's, there's things that are worse out there. You Come can on. buy a, a lot of ground beef in bulk yeah. and freeze it. Yeah. And white rice. White rice has got to be cheaper than top ramen. Ooh, I don't know. Mm. Not calorie, not calorie for calorie. You but, sure? But I would. If you but, buy a huge bag. Of I mean, it. I was of par yeah. I was partially being funny when I said that, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and truthful, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, there's. I, I think white rice is pro white rice and chicken thighs has probably been a staple, and ground beef, mm -hmm. and 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 ground turkey, and all. I think you, you I'll can tell you how not to bulk on a budget. A lot of guys think that they're going to bulk by taking weight gainer shakes. They're actually expensive if you. Oh yeah, if you break down yeah. per if you, calorie, if you break them down in in comparison to what I just said, because this is how I bulked when I was a kid. When I was trying to bulk, I'm going to read that ingredient list in just a second, Doug. Thank you. <laughs> when I was a kid trying to bulk, my my go-to was I would go to the grocery store, and ground beef you'll find on sale somewhere always. Yeah. And I would get I wouldn't get extra lean. I'd get 85 percent lean, so I'd have a, a, a nice fat content. Yeah. So it's high calorie. Oh, it tastes better anyway. Yeah, I buy five pounds of it or whatever, and I'd take it home and I'd freeze how much I wasn't going to use. And I'd prepare what I was going to make, and I'd make patties, and then you season it cheap as hell, salt, mm. pepper, a little garlic, a little onion if you want. And then white rice is, you get a rice cooker if you don't, if you, if you, yeah, uh, and you can go to Costco and buy that by the 10 pound bag. Yeah, buy it by the 10 pound bag. 
make your white rice for the day and literally three meals, you, you know, ground beef and rice, ground beef and rice, ground beef. Now, vegetables is where it can get a little bit tricky, but you can also buy a frozen bag yeah, of frozen like- frozen vegetables. Yeah. Look look at, medleys or whatever. Wow. Look at what's in Top Ramen. It's got, I can't, I mean, there's a it's whole like bunch a of shit. It's like a gluten bomb. It's, it's, <laughs> oh, wow. It's, uh, There's where all my psoriasis came from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, flour and, uh, and, and palm oil. Lots and of science words in there. Yeast extract and disodium. Ni- niacin, and, man. There's niacin in there? Wow, there's a lot of stuff in there. Succinate. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at it, it's like super- Maltodextrin. It's like, um, it's, it's dried and then it just comes to life. You have a little bit of water. You know what I used to eat a lot when I was a kid? Uh, Cup of noodle. Cup of noodle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cup of noodle. Yeah, yeah. Remember those things? That was yeah, a staple was uh, that that. Uh, trainer trainer meal, too, because you would just heat add it up in the water. Yeah, yeah, two minutes in the microwave yeah. and water. What'd you say, Justin? What? Yeah, I was that kid. I, there was always that kid <laughs> that had the cup of noodle <laughs> for and lunch. Stunk. Yeah. That was the same kid that ate corn nuts. I, don't, <laughs> I wanted to kill that kid. I loved corn nuts. Of course you did. Those are so. No, uh, ground beef is good. White rice is good. Uh, if you're not. Gluten intolerant, you don't have issues with gluten, and pasta is cheap as hell. Yeah, and pasta, it's very inexpensive. And you can buy a lot of calories. You can buy spinach in bulk for your veggie, so you can get quite a bit of spinach mm-hmm. for, and, and it's and it's uh, nutrient dense. Yeah, so that's broccoli's probably. not too expensive. Yeah, yeah. In fact, good. vegetables, uh, vegetables themselves. I mean, if you go organic, you're going to pay a lot more. But I, I think if you're really trying to save money, first off, when you want to look at your health, uh, organic. I hate to say this, isn't the top of the list. Yeah. It's it's more about your, your calories, your macronutrients, um, you know, the types of foods that you're eating, and then you can go down the list. Yeah, I was all I would always look for the cuts that were on sale, you know, when I was in college and then grill them up on my foreman grill and then I'd have some rice or something that, you know, adjacent to that. But that was always just something that I could easily do. And that was more out of just you know, because I'm I was a lazy college mm-hmm. student. You know, that it's a good point that you just brought up, Sal, that I think you should elaborate on a little bit too as far as the 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 hierarchy of Mm -hmm. like you know and this is something that this is something i do appreciate that lane talks about because i know that he he hammers this type of stuff home is you know if you're if you're eating uh you know organic food but then you're eating in a caloric surplus or you're not doing your workouts or your macronutrient profile you're not hitting your protein intake you're not getting enough a uh, sufficient amount of fats in your diet like you're missing on all these things but then you're eating all organic like you're no, you're not better off than the person who's no. probably eating all non-organic foods, but is hitting their macro targets and and training and feeding themselves properly. I used to take clients. I used to do this back in the day where I would take a client to the grocery store. Do you guys ever do this? Yep. Mm-hmm. And yes. I'd help them pick foods out. And I had this one client who was like, "Oh, I'm I you know I'm vegan because it's healthier for me. It wasn't for moral reasons." So I said, you know, her and I had this debate over it. So we went to the grocery store, and we're going, she's taking me through the throat because I told her, I said, all right, buy what you'll normally get and then I'll help you, you know, make better choices. Well, everything so, processed. So we're, we're going through the frozen food section and because she wanted to be vegan because she thought that was healthier and she's grabbing, you know, uh, vegan meat patties and vegan mm-hmm. sausage. And I said, hold on a second. I said, let's grab this for a second. And I turned it around. I said, do me a favor and look at the amount of ingredients. Look at the engineering and ingredients that's in this vegan meat patty to make it taste like meat. Mm-hmm. And, and just because it's not, it doesn't contain any animal products, doesn't make it uh, automatically healthy. Same thing with the whole organic thing. You can eat organic candy, organic, uh, you know, potato chips, organic French fries, and think this is healthy. When your macronutrients are crazy, your calories are eating too many calories, it shouldn't be at the top of your list. The top of your list should be those other things. And so, especially if it's on, if you're on a budget and you're like, okay. I need to make this dollar. I need to stretch this dollar as far as it's going to go mm. and be healthy. And I want to bulk, which requires more food. The most important thing you need to look at are calories and macros. Then you go into looking at, you know, types of foods yeah, and quality, then quality and yeah. all, all that stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, oatmeal is another good one. You could buy bulk oatmeal. Just plain old dry oatmeal. Beans too, man. Beans yeah, and beans. rice is a great carb source right for for people and it's got a, you know not a ton of protein but a decent amount yeah, beans de- decent amount for sure yeah i mean yeah. it's not you know for a vegetable or whatever um i used to we make uh in the it, right now it's my favorite time to make this we katrina makes this uh and you could use beef if you need more calories for the bulk but i mean we use ground turkey but we do a, a ground turkey chili that has i mean i think 
three or four different types of beans. I think we use kidney beans, garbanzo beans, uh, what other beans, black beans, and then something else in there, and then tomatoes diced up, and then the ground turkey and the chili powder, and like make this chili that's just amazing. And that's a great meal you can do in a crock pot or a big, huge pot, and then it lasts you all week long, and you're, you're mm. scooping it. And it's one of those things. I love things that get better as it sits in your refrigerator. So as the juices get all absorbed and all the meats and the beans oh, and yeah. stuff like that, like that, that chili just gets better and better every day. And it's a, a pretty cheap meal that you can make. I love it. The other thing too is if you don't have a dairy intolerance, whole milk is relatively inexpensive and is a great source of calories. If you want a post-workout shake, buy whole milk. In fact, I think there's studies that show that whole milk – does as good it's a like job the same, yeah. at replenishing glycogen and all that stuff and, and recovery. Right, it's like getting a protein uh, powder. Yeah, that was one of the ways I did it too as a teenager. Is I would, yeah. I would have, I would buy whole milk at the grocery store and I would just drink whole milk. I would drink two gallons like a week. Did you really? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah, and it's it's good quality uh, calories for someone who's maybe skinny and, and you know trying to bulk. Um, when I owned my personal training studio, at one point. I had to scale back on my business and I had to really start to save money. And so what my meals looked like were I would I stopped eating out because that's always real expensive, right? And But I, at the time I wanted to bulk. There was this period when I still wanted to bulk. And I would come to work and I'd have three meals and they would consist of uh, white rice, ground beef, and uh, spinach. And it would be kind of mixed in there all together. And they'd be like 800 calorie meals. And they yeah. were, t- it, listen, ground beef and rice is delicious. I still do yeah. that to this day. Oh, yeah. I still mix it together. With a little bit of mushrooms and onions. Isn't that's, that what that's Stan Efferdine had his whole monster mash? It's all based on that sort of. Oh, no, bison. Combo, right? We talk yeah, about bison. Bison, bison yeah. is such a group. Yeah. It's a little more, exp- bison's a little bit more expensive. It is more expensive. Yeah. And then the other thing to talk about, too, I guess, since it's on the same subject about bulking, is one of the troubles that you may run into when you're trying to bulk is. Uh, you know, when you're eating all this food, if you start to feel bloated or you get full real fast because you're eating foods that you don't digest very well, it makes it hard to eat more calories. Mm-hmm. One thing you might want to consider is easily digestible food. So I know we talked about pasta and, and, and that kind of stuff, but you know, white rice is such an easy thing to digest that for, for me at least, I could eat way more of it and, and be able to eat more. Whereas if I ate a big bowl of pasta, I would feel like, oh, I, wouldn't, I couldn't eat anymore. Right. So it made it more difficult, you know, for me to bulk. Next question is from Healthy, Happy, and Free. What's your favorite isolation move? Do you know what this is, Justin? I don't. This is a foreign language, right? Yeah. yeah right. You guys go first. <laughs> you know, it's going to take some thought. Why don't we go through the whole body? No. Go through each body part and pick a favorite. Every single one? Yeah, why not? Oh, God. This doesn't be that way. I, I think maybe you should you should make an argument for one that has been a, a go to one for yourself. Staple? And for, yes. Because I have one that comes to mind that. I think is going to be different. Better not be mine. No, I doubt it. Okay. I don't know if I've ever seen you even do it. Uh, I know we taught it um, on the YouTube channel when we first moved into this space, so I know there's a YouTube on it. I'll, I'll make the commitment to put it on my Insta story either before this goes live or when this goes live. Um, and I know it's in a focus session in our MAPS Aesthetic program, and that is a bent-over rear delt fly on the cable machine. Um, and I'll tell you why this is a favorite move of mine. One, um, I think the rear delts are one of the most overlooked uh, muscles on somebody's body when you're trying to develop an aesthetic physique and and putting a lot of emphasis on the rear delt, I think really brings the upper body together. And this is just my personal experience. It's so true. Everybody thinks side delts, side delts yeah. gives you the round shoulders. It's not. It's the rear delt. Yeah, the rear delt gives you that spade look, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, it really completes the whole look. And it's not to take away from the doing lateral exercises at all. I'm not saying that that at all, or even the front. But we do we do everything anteriorly. We're anteriorly driven in everything, right? So your bench press and all your shoulder press movements are always the front. Everyone seems to have these great front delts. Some people have decent side delts, but very few people. I meet, I see these these just pronounced rear delts. And when you do, it brings the back together. It creates a, a, a more of a V-taper look. It makes the shoulders look amazing in a tank top or a cutoff. Like, so, and that movement, I mean, you just, you've got complete tension on it if, if performed correctly. And I'll, I'll do a video where I kind of break down how to do it without getting your, your traps and rhomboids incorporated so much with it. Cause I think there's, there's a, a right and a wrong way to do it. 
Uh, but that, man, was one of the movements uh, that I included into my routine quite a few years back, probably five, six years back, maybe a little bit longer, that I think really helped develop my rear delts, which in my opinion really helped my physique when I was competing and I think has made a big difference in my overall appearance of, of, of like my V taper and yeah, shit. That's a good exercise. I, I, I learned that early on when I was younger lifting weights. I, I, I have narrow shoulders naturally. I don't have this really wide uh, bone structure like uh, Adam or Justin. And so I really wanted my shoulders to, to come out and I wanted to develop them really well. And um, I read an article by, I, I can't, I think Charles Glass wrote it. You guys know who Charles Glass was? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was a, like the, one of the best bodybuilder trainers and he was all po- you know popular in the 90s. And he talked all about the rear delts and how you need to develop them. And um, I focused a lot on them after reading that article. And it's what gave my delts their look. Until this day, my delts are one of my better uh, body parts. And it was because of all the – and I actually started all my workouts with rear delt yes, exercises. That's something that I prioritize did different them. too is that I, instead of – the typical – Shoulder routine that you see overhead is press first. Overhead yeah. press first, mm-hmm. which is and it's not a knock on that that it's that's wrong, but I think flipping it on its head, the rear delt is just as damn big as the as as your your anterior delt. So you doing a rear delt movement first, and it's neglected the most, saving your energy for that training that first, and then working your way to the front mm-hmm. uh, was a, a game changer. Now for me. I'm going to pick an isolation exercise uh, that I fell in love with early on because. It did what a lot of isolation exercises promise to do, and it did what a lot of isolation exercises typically don't do. So let's go into those two things first. What isolation exercises are really good at doing, and the reason why they should be included in your routine, they shouldn't be your entire routine, but they should be included, is that isolation exercises isolate. So if if you want to connect to a muscle, a specific area or muscle, then there's no better way to do that than isolation exercises. This is why I think bodybuilders have the best mind-to-muscle connection over any other strength athlete because that's literally their entire game. Their entire game is to feel, connect to a muscle, and develop a particular muscle. And so if you're somebody who uh, you know does all these bench presses for your chest, for example, and you're, you just don't feel it in your chest, even though your weight is going up and you're lifting, you're bench pressing 300 pounds and you're real strong, but then you look in the mirror and you're like, ah, oh, my chest is not very developed. Isolation exercises are a great way to get you to connect to the pecs and change the feel of a bench press and then make it more effective. And this is true for all body parts. Glutes is another one. If, you don't, if you're doing squats and deadlifts and all the exercises everybody says to do for your butt, but it's just not developing, isolation exercises teach you how to connect to those muscles. And that's what they're supposed to do. But something they're not supposed to do is build a lot of muscle. Everybody says and everybody knows that isolation exercises – they don't really build a ton of muscle, and they're not really extra, movements typically that you can go really heavy in because form starts to break down and they start to not, uh, they're just not very effective. But one isolation exercise in particular actually does both pretty damn fucking well. I wouldn't say it's as good as a compound movement, but it's one of the best muscle building isolation exercises I've ever done, and that's a pullover. A, a good old fashioned dumbbell or especially barbell. Pullover. Now, I started doing these early on because I would read all these old uh, muscle building uh, magazines, like old ones. I used to love grabbing these books that you know I could find that were from the 50s or 60s. Uh, and in those in those days, bodybuilders would brag about how much they could do a barbell pullover with. Believe it or not, this was an exercise that they would actually try to get stronger with. And you'd see these guys would brag about being able to do. 300 pound barbell pullovers and it was just you know they'd have guys like pinning their legs down so they wouldn't flip off a bench and they do all this weight so that got me interested in doing a, a dumbbell pullover and then i read mike menser's book uh heavy duty and he's a big uh, proponent of pre-exhausting uh muscles because he's all about the one set to failure thing and he's like okay well you should pre-exhaust the muscle first before doing compound movement to really fatigue it that was his theory so i did dumbbell pullovers for the first time and for the first time i felt my lats doing uh, pull-ups or rows. I never felt my, I was a kid, right? I never felt my lats, but I did all these back exercises, never got a pump on my lats. Then I did pull-overs and all of a sudden I got a pump on my lats and I was blown away. Then because of that, I fell in love with the exercise and I actually got to the point where I was doing, I could do pull-overs with, still right now, I could do 120 pound uh, dumbbell pull-overs, no problem. And I got real heavy at one point, getting up to a, a 170 pound barbell pull-overs. And they actually 
built mass in my lats. Um, and you do get some pec activation, but it is technically an isolation movement. You're seeing more and more people use that exercise now. Um, but for a while there, people just didn't do the pullover. Now, if you think about it from a functional standpoint, and I know, I know Justin loves this uh, part of, uh, of working out, functionally speaking, a lot of exercises don't do that motion, that overhead, that from mm-hmm. overhead motion. You don't do a lot of resistance exercises that way. You're either- Unless you're doing like an overhead pass or something like that, but yeah, really, you're not going to emulate that. Not bodybuilding or anything like that. No, 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 no. And no. that's an important like function uh, right. of the body. It's actually, I would consider it a uh, foundational function of the body. Our shoulders, the way that they're structured, if you look at our scapula and the way it moves and all that stuff- Humans evolved to throw. We're actually the mo- uh, the most accurate thrower- throwing animals uh, on earth, obviously, because we were, were apex hunters. We hunted with spears. And so that motion is actually a, fund- a fundamental movement. Mm-hmm. And if you neglect that movement overhead, um, it's probably not a good idea. And I've actually gotten a lot of people's shoulder mobility and strength. Now, here's the thing. If you don't have good shoulder mobility, yeah. it can injure you. Right. Uh, but if you work up to it and do it right, it really improves the the stability of the shoulder. So it's like this amazing exercise that I every time I write a workout, I put pullovers in it every single time. So we're online now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> back to AOL. It's, it's, um, my, what I was talking about got dramatic. There for a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the heavens opened up. Yeah, uh, yeah, mine isn't gonna be as cool as your guys i i don't really like i don't have like a very specifically targeted area of my body except for i went through a period of really trying to build and develop my chest and i feel that for some reason it was passed along to me that like having this big powerful chest was really going to help to contribute to um you know football and that would carry over into like pushing people off or um, you know, being more powerful in a sense. Whereas I found out later, like what really uh, contributed more towards power was, you know, through the hips and, and you know, core and be more explosive and, and more strength in my legs. Uh, so I was more focused on chest exercises. And uh, I did struggle for a bit because I was pretty dominant, uh, you know, in my shoulders for a bit where, you know, anteriorly where, um, you know, I wouldn't feel my chest get as involved and activated. So it took me a process of really opening up and getting that scapular retraction. And one exercise that I felt that's pretty like bro and, and, you know, straightforward was, it was a cable fly and <laughs> I, I, it's so bro dude, but like I, <laughs> I used to spend suggestion. so much time there because I could really, I could really feel um, my way through that tension and, and holding certain parts of that range of motion. And then it would really stretch and open me up. And now I would squeeze and be able to isolate the chest and pull. And I would even hold it uh, in the middle for an extended amount of time until my chest would start to respond and fire and then come back. And as simple as that was, I would go back to do bench press and it was just like, whoa, it, it unlocked more involvement from my actual chest muscle where before that was more of a bouncing kind of a momentum process. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Someone who struggles with that, um, one of my favorite things to take them through is to lie a foam roll down on the ground and uh, yeah, you uh, showed me that. Yeah. down their spine. So you lay on it to where your, your head is supported and it runs all the way down to your tailbone. And that just kind of drops the scapula, not gravity, obviously, because you're laying down and you're looking up and you do a dumbbell chest fly there. Such a great movement for somebody who struggles with the the shoulder retraction and holding that. Because that's what happens is, especially when you're a guy similar to you, Justin, who's who's lifting for more athletic performance, like you just want to get stronger, more explosive. And so there's less emphasis on the mind-muscle connection. And it's more about Mm -hmm. how can I get my body to work together to move this weight explosively because that translates into sports way better right so then you ask a guy like that to all of a sudden hey let's build your pecs or let's focus on your chest Mm -hmm. and it's like that's a really difficult thing to do when you've been training a certain way for a really long time that movement where you lay somebody on there i think really helps that uh teach them to open up their chest Well, yeah, if you're looking to sculpt your body aesthetically um connecting to your muscles is crucial um, because if you're looking in the mirror and you want to develop one area over another, 
I mean, you could do all the movements that are supposedly designed to target it, but if you don't connect to the muscle very well, you're going to be left with a, a weaker body part. But that being said, there's also a benefit for performance athletes to learn how to connect the muscles because, and I'll, 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 you know, bring this to you, Justin, when you find, when you learn how to connect to your chest, did you see your bench press numbers go up? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, and, and I, this is something I like to c- communicate to to athletes because a lot of times, like, well, I don't need to isolate muscles. I don't need to feel them. Say, so, well, it's not nearly as important for you as it is for a bodybuilder. But learning how to connect to them, then you go back and you do your movement. Um, you, well, it, it creates a louder signal. I mean, there's mm-hmm. more muscle fibers you have potentially. Yeah, there's a lot more potential to activate and mm-hmm. in, in, in involve within that overall movement. So. Well, not to mention you're also you're also teaching. So, and I guess there's an order of operation for an athlete. As an athlete, I mean, maybe first I, I care more about the the ability for him to to move the weight, and then eventually I get I care more about the isolation stuff because what I want him to be able to do is to use the biggest, strongest muscle of the movement, right? So mm-hmm. you may get you want it to be efficient, right? Right. So you may that I think that's the real carryover for the athletes is that okay, if there's a movement that you're performing and you're really good and explosive at it, but you're not, you don't feel it in the right muscle group. Well, that could be a, a, a sign that, oh, wow, you're not even using the right muscle to its fullest potential. And if we can learn to do that, then that movement will become even, you'll be even better at that exactly. movement. Next question is from Junior Fit 978 Can you guys talk about how it was when you first got certified as a personal trainer? What mistakes did you make and what successes did you have along the way? God, I remember. Mm. Do you remember your first one? Oh, yeah. I So I got certified in 19, well, Apex was the first one, 1998 right? was, I think, 98 and when I first got hired as a personal trainer. I uh, was right out of high school. And um, at the time, I got, well, obviously, I, got, I worked at 24 Hour Fitness. And the certification was their certification. Yeah. So if you get a you get employed at Twenty Four Fitness, they would accept you with a national certification. But if you don't have one, they'd still hire you, mm-hmm. and then they would send you to their certification classes. You'd have to pass a test, mm-hmm. and then they considered you a certified trainer. And so that's what I did. So I, I I got my job there. The next class was I believe uh, three weeks later. Um, uh, right out the gates, I got clients, and I told them all I couldn't train them until I was certified. So I had something like 25 clients waiting for me to get certified. Talk Damn. About, talk about pressure. Oh, yeah, right away. I was I was selling training. I had all these people waiting for me. But talk about pressure to pass my test. <laughs> and I remember you know, my manager telling me, like, if you don't pass, you you, you can't work here. Um, you're going to lose all those clients because you need to pass this test because we're not going to do another one for an entire month. Mm-hmm. And you've got all these people waiting for you. You've already promised uh, that you're going to be training them. So there's a lot of pressure. So I was a little scared. Now, at, at this point, all the knowledge that I had in regards to fitness was my own personal fitness knowledge and bodybuilding magazine knowledge. So I knew exercises really well. Like I could name, you know, 15 exercises per body part. I knew generally what good form looked like. I knew how to use every machine in the gym. Um, and that was my, that was kind of what, what I knew. So I walk into this certification course and I had no idea what they were going to test me on. And there was almost no testing on exercises at all. Like it was almost zero. What's a good exercise for this area? What's a good exercise for that area? A lot of the testing was name this muscle, name the attachment, name the insertion. So it was like this memorization Mm -hmm. process and I remember being like, oh, fuck. And then I remember them telling me shit that was, uh, at the time, I remember hearing it being like, really? Is that really what yeah. we're supposed to do? We're like, don't go below 90 degrees when you bench press and don't squat below 90 degrees. And later on, I realized it was because they wanted to you know, make sure we didn't hurt anybody. But I took it to heart and ended up training you know, people like that for a while. But that, that's what I did. They sent us all this. We went to this course. And, oh, here's a funny side story. We're sitting in this class, and I'm the, the youngest guy by far. So I'm sitting. I'm this fucking eighteen year old, you know, kid, um, and I'm sitting there, and I'm surrounded by all these like, you know, personal tr- people who've been working out for a while, and they're all in their mid twenties. And there was this dude that was sitting next to me, who's fucking just jacked. And we're sitting there, and when we got out, I was like, Bleh. why, you know, bro, what do you do? Like, what's your workout? Not knowing the guy was probably all geared up. Um, and he's like, oh, I, I just take this supplement right here, and he pulled out this bottle of some bullshit. It was like some 
some test booster <laughs> and I went home and bought it that day, of course. <laughs> it did nothing for me. I remember I showed my cousin. But he my, was so big. Yeah, I showed yeah. my cousin, big dude, I fucking get certified. <laughs> he told me to take this shit. It makes you bigger. And oh, I bought so, it and it did, so typical. Did, yeah, it didn't do a damn thing for me. <laughs> yeah. But I, I took this the all the material home and I had to memorize uh, the names of all these different muscles and their insertion and origin. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there and I was a I, you know, in high school, it was so easy for me to, to pass high school. I never studied. So this is the first time I actually studied. I'd never studied before. Oh, wow. And I thought the way you studied was to read just everything. And so that's all I did. I read everything. And then as I'm going through trying to memorize things, I remember my mom came in the, in the, in the dining room. That's where I was sitting studying. And she goes, why don't you just make flashcards? I'm like, what are flashcards? So she taught me how to make flashcards. Oh, my God. Yeah, dude. so so then I did flashcards to memorize uh, everything, and then I passed my test. This, and is how I, like, this is how I taught my trainers to pass. So I actually – I had a national cert before. So You walked in with one? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I assumed um, I couldn't even be a personal trainer unless I had a national certification because <laughs> about a year before I became a trainer – I was online searching uh, for how to become a personal now, trainer. Now, what year is this, roughly? Uh, 2000. Yeah, okay. 2000. Okay. Yeah, because Or 99, even, because it was right out of high school. Well, no, 2000. Okay. 2000. 2000 was when, and then 01 was when I started working there. Mm -hmm. So 2000 is when I'm researching it, trying to find out how to become a personal trainer. Because at that time, I was going to school for Kines. I thought, uh, since I'm going that direction anyways... How about being a personal trainer part time? It would be a cool gig, and so I looked up uh, certifications and like what I needed, and it said you know you didn't need a certification to be a personal trainer anywhere. And the one that popped up that was uh, most widely searched at that time was IFPA, so uh, I think International Fitness Prof Professionals Association, I think, um, which was uh, fairly easy because. The test, I believe, I was able to uh, take it home and send it in to get it. So it wasn't like a really tough, uh, tough thing for me to get by. So that was my first introduction to a certification, and that one was, I think, pretty basic for me. It didn't, I didn't feel like it was that, that challenging. I didn't think I felt like I learned a lot. I was already a fitness guy, like Sal. I read a lot of the magazines, like Justin. I was into sports, and so that was kind of my background, and I was already into working out myself. Now, when I and then when I went got hired at 24, I also went through the 24 hour fitness university, which was the week long course. And then at the end, they had a big test. And that was like Sal said, that was probably a little more challenging than even like the first national certification I had. The first hard test that I took or felt that, that I felt was hard was NASM. So NASM, when I was introduced to that and why it was so challenging was exactly what you said, Sal, and is exactly how I coach every trainer to pass that test is I'm like, before you even read it, go to the back, go to the glossary, write all the terms down and make flashcards mm -hmm. because 90% of that test is vocabulary. If yeah. you understand what they're asking and you have some gym common sense example, uh, abduction of the humerus in the horizontal plane is flexion of what muscle. Yeah. And it's like, that sounds really complicated, but if you can just break down what the fuck that means, and do it like yeah. with your hands. You go like, yeah, yeah. You're like, okay, yeah. So you're like oh, that's a, yeah, way. that's okay. Yeah. That's a chest fly. Okay, I get it. That yeah. works your chest. And then the question would be, you know, what muscle are you working? And then they, then there's in on NASM. There's always two that are kind of close, and then two that are way far. Like it'll yeah. be like your 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 gastrocnemius and your soleus, and then it'll be like your pec, and then your you know your your rhomboids yeah. or something. And so then it's so funny how it's so vocabulary driven when that shit is zero important. Yeah, it is. Which you, muscle is you distal? Which one is it? Yeah, pretty much <laughs> the first year of training. Yeah, it's like that's if you talk to a client like that, you're not gonna have clients. No, 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 no. and I never did even afterwards. So like, I mean, I think you, I think you had to know. But I'll tell you what I remember that makes me chuckle. Um, and this again, this is how I even coach my trainers. Trainers are they get involved in the fitness right, and they, they decide they want to be a trainer. And the most common thing that I get would get from a staff or from one of my trainers would be. Uh, I'm really nervous. I'm really nervous to, to teach these people. Mm -hmm. and, and I would remind them that, listen, they're coming and they're hiring you. You already know more than they do. Even if you don't feel like you know a lot, you know yeah. more than them. So the things that you felt you have learned in this last year or whatever of getting your certification, stick with that. Stick with what you've learned and what you know and, and drill that home and give that to them. That's mm -hmm. going to be of great value to them and they're going to appreciate it. So for me, that was the core. Because before NASM, 
I did not know what my TVA was. I didn't understand core really, and I was just fascinated by this. You're the core guy. I was the core guy. I mean, that was. <laughs> I was walking around the gym and stopping everybody doing an exercise and showing them how to incorporate more core into that same exercise. So yeah. I'm bal- yeah. telling people to balance on uh, one leg, doing bicep curls. I'm telling them, term of oh, the day. man, and I could break it down, dude. I had the whole spiel for selling somebody on the importance. I mean, I, I even remember saying this, like, you know, your core muscle is the most important muscle in your body besides your besides heart. Besides your heart. Yeah. <laughs> Because, of course, without your heart, you're dead, right? So besides that, the core is the most- Stabilizes your spine in all directions. Right, and then I would talk about all the the 29 different muscles that wrap around your spine like a vacuum and the importance of being able to engage You ever do the the, the pencil example where you you got the loose pencil? You learned that from me. You tightened up. Of course you course you. Of course (laughs) course you you taught me that. Yeah, Yeah. no, that was- Fucking pencil trick. That that was my my pitch was around the core, and so- (laughs) Man, I remember I, that vividly. I, I drilled that home for a very long these, these time. Pitches, Imagine a pencil. It's yeah. got these, a lot of movement and travel. Yes. Bro, these, now you tighten your core. Stabilize. You, you want to hear what, a pitch that I learned from the Apex certification that was just like, it was so powerful? Yeah. So I, that Because the, the next cert I did was Apex, which was the nutrition one, but really it was just how to sell supplements. And I remember they taught us how the macronutrients, they compared them to different types of fuel. And how they'd burn because <laughs> one of the things about Apex at the time was they would they would test you. Uh, you fill out a questionnaire and oh. they would tell you if you were a slow, medium, or fast oxidizer. But by the way, this is all bullshit. But this is what yeah. they would say. And then based upon that, will help determine your macronutrient profile. And this I use this by the way forever. I would sit in front of someone selling membership or personal training because I thought this was the, the thing. And I'd be like, okay, you want to think of your carbs as paper. Your protein is kindling, and your fat is logs. And if you were to throw all those things in a fire, which one would burn first, second, and third? Obviously, the paper would burn very quickly. The the, the protein next, and the fat third. Well, if you're a very fat oxid, uh, excuse me, a very fast oxidizer, uh, that means that you're like a very hot fire. And if we just feed you lots and lots of it's carbohydrates, stoke the fire. You're going to get a great energy uh, uh, at first, but then you're going to drop off because all the energy would be gone. Fast oxidizers need a lot more fats and proteins. Right. If you're a slow oxidizer, then we, and I would <laughs> oh, do this whole thing, and beautiful. it was like, and it's so funny how I can't like, remember the one. I just remember <laughs> lipotropics and pyruvate, like oh, just, yeah. just slinging those I had, out like I, crazy. I had the lipo <laughs> and, burner. and the pyruvate pitch too, man. I remember yeah. that. You know, the, the takeaway though from this, I think, and the the successful part, and I think the part that I tried to teach anybody that ever worked for me is to not to not overcomplicate this process that. Um, you probably do know more than the average person who's coming in. Is ninety percent of the shit you know, you're not even gonna yeah. be able to apply to an right. average person. Well, I was one of those trainers though that was real insecure because like I valued <laughs> what I was teaching people. You know, like I come in from like uh, you came in college, yeah. yeah, like too much. Like I knew. Like I felt like I knew nothing because I learned all this stuff about the anatomy and physiology, and now trying to communicate that to your average person, I, I'd get people that just stare at me like, "What." Like, yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. Are we going to work out yet or what? And right. I'm just like trying so hard to educate, yeah. you know, and I'm like, I'm doing like the Davies test, you know, yeah. and like I'm doing all this unnecessary shit yeah. <laughs> that I could just figure out on my own and they don't need to like know what I'm doing, but I could assess them as they're doing the movement, you know, and that came a lot later with like, let's simplify this. These are average people that have, you know, just, just goals that are just like losing weight, I, feeling better, getting stronger. I had a lot of success. Success with this is, I would I and and over the course of my entire career, I I got quite a few national certifications. Not as many as Danny. I think Danny's got thirty. I don't think I got anywhere near thirty. That's insane. I think <laughs> the most I had. I think I've gotten four. Yeah. My whole career. I think I had eight, eight between eight and ten. I don't yeah, remember like five or six. But after every one that I I would get, I'd get something from that. Like there would be there would always be something that was like, oh wow, that was I that was something I didn't really understand or I really understand now or wow I feel this is important and I would just drill that home with clients I would give them that now because I that was this is newfound information for me and inevitably you you run across things that you've never seen before. I mean, I remember the first time I got gout. I remember the first time I got somebody that was paralyzed on one side. I remember, you know what I'm saying? I, you end up, or somebody who just had shoulder surgery, like you start getting these things as a, and instead of trying to fake it till you make it or act like you know everything, you say, you know, this is the first time I dealt with this. So what I'll do is I'll, you know, I'll refer back to my, my books and I'll get back to you on what we should do. And, and 
I was okay with that. I was I was comfortable with with being able to say I don't know, but I'll find out. And for people you. appreciate that. And they do appreciate it, and that's also a great way to learn because now I have a reason to learn about the knee because I just have a client now who's coming fresh off of a knee surgery, and I got to rehab it, and I'm not quite sure where I should take them or how I should take them. And that's okay to communicate that with them, but make sure, and then tell them that you're going to learn that. And that was an easy, fun way for me to continue to grow as a trainer. And that's where the kind of the experience and the wisdom comes from too, is that, you know, you've, you, once you've logged enough hours and you've seen enough clients, you've probably seen damn near almost every condition. And if you've done your due diligence of, you know, Hey, I don't know, but I will find out and going home and reading up on it and learning. It's, it's, it's amazing how much that compiles. Justin, when you first got, got there because you had a degree in a fitness related field, which was what kinesiology. Yeah. Um, and before that, I didn't even think I was going to use it. So I thought I was going to go back into construction. Mm. Like that's, I, I literally had no idea what I was going to do with my degree. It was more about, or actually I was, I was pursuing like sports marketing. Like I was trying to get into the business end of like, mm -hmm. you know, sports teams and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so I, I just knew that I liked the process of working out when I was playing on teams and really missed uh, the off season aspect of it, which was actually my, when I think back about my most fond memories of, of football and uh, any other sport that I played, baseball, basketball, it was the training uh, you know, in the off season, uh, and then the expression of that, how I could improve in the game and see that. But, uh, so what, I just saw, I just saw an advertisement for, for 24 hour fitness that they were looking what for. What year trainers. was that? It had to be like 2003. I want to, th I want to say 2003, maybe and 2004. Then, and at that time, did they require you to get certified if you had a degree or were you cool because you already had a degree? I think that's how I was able to come in was cause I had okay. a degree and I was leaning on that mm -hmm. because, uh, and then I went to the, that same class. Like you guys had like a week long class. Yeah, he still had to go. I yeah. went to the class. Now was it stupid the class because you had done all the other stuff? Were you like, all right? It was yeah, easy. yeah, yeah. Like, but I was still nervous because I, sure. I really val. I, anytime I'm doing anything new, like I get like I, I. I get really like anxious, and nervous, like, yeah. nervous Nancy. I am a nervous. Like I, I want, like, I don't want to suck. Like I hate sucking at things, you know, but I still do it. Like, cause yeah. I know, and I, and I acknowledge that I'm going to suck at it, but I just, I go into things with a very much of a, a humble attitude of like, mm. I know nothing, mm. even though I had all that background. Like I still approached it. Like I didn't know anything. I, I used to love the, the trainers that would, I would hire who were super knowledgeable not because they were the successful trainers, because oftentimes they weren't the successful ones. I hated those ones. It, it, yeah, hated those oftentimes they weren't the most <laughs> successful because they didn't have the communication skills. Yeah. They had a big chip on their shoulder many times. Like, oh, I've got a master's degree and whatever. I'm like, well, great. You have no clients. you know. So, yeah. um, But <laughs> the reason why I like them and what I used to do is I used to always have, and this is even when I was a general manager, so they, they didn't even work directly under me. They work under the, my, the, my fitness manager. But I still would bring them on board, and I'd find them, and I'd hire them, and I'd want at least one, if not two or three on staff because, A, I could feed them clients enough to keep them uh, happy, but B, I used to love having them. I'd have these classes, and I would do these sales training courses for my trainers, but because I know trainers hate that shit, I would always have the smart trainer teach some technical whatever, and they were also good to give the complicated clients to. Like you're going to get the client who's got really bad issues. Mm -hmm. uh oh, send him to Johnny. He's the you know he's got the master's degree in, in movement, or he used to be a physical therapist. Or I would ask them questions. And to be quite honest, nothing taught me more about the knowledge of training, not the application. The application came from experience, but the knowledge of training was working with really smart people. Like I had a physical therapist that worked in my wellness facility. And I used to love, and it was, it's a small space. It was all one-on-one -on -one stuff. So it wasn't a huge gym and I'd watch her rehab people and communicate to people. And then she would do her, her files with them in their charts. And I'd walk over and ask her questions about the charts. And I learned way more from working with her than I did through any certification. All Just because right. I saw her apply it. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, yeah. It was really yeah. good. Next question is from Colby Sorensen 23. InstaFit accounts are flooding Instagram and there, are a, there is a lot of poor information out there. When will these people realize that their qualifications and experience are not worthy of posting daily fitness, nutrition, and health advice? When we stop paying them, yeah, they'll they'll stop realizing it when they when, when nobody we, pays attention yeah, to, to them. Say, we, right now, I mean, and that's just it: is we continue to pay them. 
people continue to give them money and continue to buy their programs and buy the supplements they're hustling or buy their t-shirts that they're getting from China. Like they, it's, uh, it's on us. Like I don't, I don't hate on those people. I really don't mm-hmm. like if, if we're too silly to look deeper into, into these people and, and, and find out if they're presenting good information and that just cause you look sexy does not mean that you know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. And if we're, if we don't wise up as a consumer, mm-hmm. then more power to them to take advantage of all of us. You know, like that, I think that as long as we keep feeding them money, they're going to, they're not going to die. Here's the way I look at it with, with these people is I, I look at it like, like this, it, it's a competition. Now, if, if our, mm-hmm. if our ultimate, goal or purpose behind what we're doing, which we've all established from day one, is to fundamentally shift the industry so that it actually helps people and provides good information and has integrity, then we need to learn from these people. Not not their fitness information, because that's garbage. No, why they're popular. We need to learn why they're connecting to so many people. I don't care how great your... And this is... We just talked about personal trainers with lots of knowledge. They didn't have clients because they couldn't connect to them. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy that my other trainer who had no experience or who had little experience, who didn't have a lot of knowledge, had all these clients. Why? Because they were charismatic. They were able to connect. They, you know, they had good personality, whatever. Great point. So there's something to learn. So the way I look at it is we got to beat them at their own game Mm -hmm. and at the same time deliver good information. So that's where the whole entertainment aspect comes from. That's why you listen to when you listen to our podcast. The first half of the show is us having a good time because that we know we got to draw people in. It's, well, it's, it's how you communicate. Because there's massive ego on both ends of that, right? Yes. So, yes. You, so you have the, well, I don't need to, I don't even need to go to school. This works for me. This is probably going to work for them. Right. You know, mentality versus somebody that's like got like all this education and, well, they're stupid and they're saying everything wrong. And, but, but, but meanwhile, they look like shit. And you you know they're not like applying any of that knowledge. Yeah, and, and they're and they're not able to communicate it. They're not able to communicate. So it's so we see all that, and I think that it's it's a really it's really tough to find that that middle uh, that middle ground. I don't, I don't know if I've really seen a, a good job of that yet. We well, strive I, to, I to do say, that. I like to think that we are. Well, we strive to be that. That's the goal. Yeah. yeah. No, I really I really think that we try and try and find a middle ground of entertainment um, while also educating and not being too extreme on either end, not being so entertainment that what we provide doesn't have value and not being uh, so uh, educated that it's only the other educators are interested in listening to us. So there's got to be this kind of middle ground. What I will tell you is, and I know a lot of these uh, Insta famous people that sell programs online, a lot of them aren't as successful as you think they are. Uh, we think they are because they, of course, they everybody presents the the best version of themselves on Instagram and post their cool cars and all this shit and 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 make it look like they're uh, killing it and they've got you know a million followers. But a lot of these people that have a million followers and they sell a program for twenty nine ninety nine, they they do really well because they have so many eyes on them and it's a percentage game that if you got one percent of the people that are buying from you and you've got a million followers that's a lot of money still that you're making at twenty nine dollars a pop. The problem is a lot what as consumers what you see happening is you know Susie tried you know Melissa whatevers and then Susie whatevers and then you know Frank's whatever all these insta famous people twenty nine 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 twenty nine nine twenty nine and she and she just keeps hopping around to all these people because she's not gaining any really good value, change, or consistency, or knowledge from these people that are providing this information. You know, one of the things about Mind Pump is the, and we we consider this and we pay attention to this, the lifetime value of a customer of ours is really high. And it's really high because one of the things about the programs that we present is go through it. You know, go through the program. I guarantee it'll blow you away in comparison to anything that's out there online because where most of our time, money, energy, and focus has been put into the the, the meat of it, the, the results of it, the programming behind it. It isn't the sexiest. I mean, we're going through uh, phase two right now of refacing it and trying to make it look prettier. We worked in reverse. We, we built something that, the, you know, we may only get 10 people to buy it because we only have 20 people looking at us, but the 10 people that are going to buy it 90% of them are going to be blown away from it. And those people now become billboards for us. And, go, and that's how this company has been built is is on that. Now, a lot of these Insta famous people have put so much energy into looking amazing and drawing lots of eyes on them. And then when you get to the product that you get from them, you're just kind of like, mm-hmm. 
it's not I'm not really impressed with it. You're not gonna keep you're not gonna keep selling me on more things because I'm just like, oh wow, it's just it's just that. There's nothing special to this. So Yeah, I mean we could we could sit here and complain all day long about the, you know, Jillian Michaels, you know, she did that keto thing and everybody's pissed off at her and you know, or the Dr. Oz sometimes recommending certain nutrition advice and other people disagree with him and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you know what? They're doing something right in the sense that People are listening to them, and they're not listening to you. And so instead of sitting in your corner and being pissed off about it and everybody should listen to me type of deal, figure out what they are doing that's right mm-hmm. and use that so that you can be effective with what you're doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, bottom line, you know, other industries have had people like this in the past. You know, Carl Sagan, I've brought him up many times. Carl Sagan introduced an entire generation to astrophysics. Why? Because the way he communicated it, and I bet at that time a lot of people hated on him too. You know, I bet you money. Like other physicists were like, "Oh, this guy." Well, like- actually, the, the the funny thing is, is that a lot of them liked him because he didn't compromise on his integrity. He said a lot of good things. You're right. Some of them, the the elitists, were probably like, "Oh, he's you know he's dumbing it down too much right. or whatever, or making it sound too too uh, too amazing." But the reality is, he was able to communicate astrophysics to an entire generation of people that would have never. Uh, listen to it before because otherwise it's boring. It doesn't connect. And what does it mean to me? Like, who cares about the the stars? Oh, what do you mean? We're made of stardust? Like, that was from Carl Sagan, him talking about how we're all made of stardust. I mean, that's astrophysicists don't typically talk about that kind of stuff, but he did, and it got everyday people to be fascinated by what was considered at the time very boring, dry information. And so fitness... There's a lot of science and a lot of information in fitness and health, a ton of it. The problem is if we just talk about that all the time and don't communicate it effectively, it's boring and dry and nobody cares. And also, look, if I don't impact you with my information, then my information's worth zero. Right. Like I could sit across from somebody. be the somebody, smartest guy in the room. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I could sit across from somebody who's got poor health overweight, they're eating poorly, they're not exercising, and I'm really, you know, concerned and I really want to help them. So I sit down with my in, with all my brilliant knowledge and I just talk the fuck out of their ear with all this information and they get up and they're like, whatever, and they don't change anything. I have done nothing except for make my ego feel nice that I've got all this great information. I've done nothing. Yeah. I've helped nobody. And so, if, you know, when I look at these people on Instagram and stuff like this, Part of me gets annoyed because I'm like, oh, fuck. Now more people are going to be doing attaching electric pads to their ass cheeks and shocking them throughout yeah, the day because they yeah. think that's going to make their butt grow. But then part of me is like, you know what, though? 500,000 likes on this thing. Why are people looking at this? And is there a way that I can – can I learn from this without compromising my integrity? Oh, I see opportunity. And exactly. And yeah, deliver the right information. We wouldn't, we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for all those people. Mm-hmm. Mind Pump wouldn't be as big as it's become and still growing – if it wasn't for all these terrible fitness accounts, because you're right, Sal, there's a ton of people that are thirsty for this knowledge, and there is something to learn about these people. They're getting the attention of the of our avatar, the avatar that we want to sell programs to. Are looking at all these insta, insta celebrities, and that is room for opportunity. How do we gain their attention so we then can present really good information? Yeah, because here's one thing that I did learn, uh, and that I've learned many, many times over, and it's 100 percent true. If there's two people presenting information and both of them are equally engaging, equally flashy, equally awesome to look at, but one of them has good information, like good quality information with integrity, and the other one's got shitty information, the good one's going to win yeah, every yeah. every time. Of course. And this is this was as a trainer as I as I worked through the industry and managed gyms, I w- was very good at the sales and communication aspect, but I backed it up with I knew what the fuck I was talking about. And that's that's how I was able to do as well as I did and that's the thing that I yeah, I, I always coach. I'm changing my name to Six Pack Steve. <laughs> yeah, Let's I heard. It. I heard, yeah, it's all the nicknames I see everywhere. That's that's what I'm going to do now. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, if you go to mindpumpfree.com, you can download any one of our free guides. In fact, we'll let you download all of them at no cost. So they're all free. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us on our personal Instagram pages. My page, Mind Pump Sal. Justin is Mind Pump Justin. And Adam, you guessed it, Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, 
MAPS performance, and MAPS aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.